And joining us now is Stephen Pine, an author and expert on the history, ecology, and management of fire. He is the Emeritus Professor in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University and the author of Between Two Fires, A Fire History of Contemporary America. And he has an article of The Guardian, The Australian Fires Are a Harbinger of Things to Come. Don't Ignore Their Warning. Welcome to Background Briefing, Stephen Pine. Well, thank you. And if things could not be worse in Australia, I, I'm not sure that the rest of the world grasps the true horror of what is happening to that entire continent, particularly in the main cities. You know, the main city of Sydney has been surrounded by fire since September, and it'll go on for at least another month or so until the rains begin. The whole of the country has had an average temperature of more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and we don't know the extent of the devastation to wildlife, although there are estimates that up to one billion kangaroos and koalas, etc., have died or been burned. And there's also devastation happening to the marine life in the surrounding oceans. So tell us about your diagnosis of it's what you call the Pyrocene Age. Well, first on Australia, uh, I mean, Australia is a fire continent. It, it is always burning, and it has from time to time very very powerful and savage fires but what has happened over the last 20 years culminating in in what we're seeing now is really uh, an inflection point it it really has changed they're meaner uh, they're more damaging um, it's it's not just a, a tragedy for Australia it, it it's really a national trauma talking to uh, colleagues in Australia they they are deeply troubled by it uh, they've had two fires now that have really upset their sound themselves. Uh, 2009, the Black Saturday fires killed 173 people, uh, mostly in Victoria. Uh, and then the current fires. And in a sense, those two fires are markers by which to triangulate the likely future of Australia. But I'm going to suggest there are two other fires uh, that can line up with it. One is the fires that we're seeing, the fires that burn in living landscapes, the bush, um, the fires we're used to identifying. The others are burn what I, what I call lithic landscapes, that is landscapes that were once living but are now fossilized. This is the coal, gas, oil, and the rest of it, the fossil fuel combustion. And those two realms of fire interact in curious ways that we really haven't studied systematically. And now we're finding, at first, they sort of competed with each other. They certainly compete in cities and places like our houses. But now, they, now they're now they beginning to collude. And the burning of the lithic landscapes, the fossil fuels, of course, we're familiar with the, with the climate change implications of that. Um, but apart from that, they change how people live on the landscape, how they use fire, uh, how they organize themselves, and that's the other half of the bushfire question. So in the past, people would routinely burn. They were living in uh, mostly agricultural settings uh, outside of cities, uh, and the fires couldn't spread in the same way or have the same kinds of impact. There are also a lot of nature reserves uh, for for excellent causes, but those also have to be managed. There has to be fire in them, certainly in a place like Australia, getting the right kind of fire. So all of this has been disrupted. So we've got it on both sides. In a sense, we're burning both ends of our combustion candle. Now, is every place going to look like Australia? Of course not. Even by Australian standards, this is extraordinary. But those places that are prone to fire, like Australia, like California, are seeing uh, an uptick uh, in the cumulative effects, and that is very likely to continue. So when I, I've been troubled by the future, I mean, I've got kids, I've got grandkids. What kind of world are, are we leaving them, trying to understand it? Uh, I've been struck by people who say the future is so strange and so dire. We have no narrative by which to connect it to our past, and we have no analog to think about how we might live with it. But I'm a fire historian. I'm a fire guy, and I think fire provides a great narrative for us. Humanity and fire is the narrative, and when we decided to change how we burn things and what we burned and how we interacted with fire and the planet, we've created a new era and I, I've started to call it the Pyrocene as a sort of fire-informed era. 
And I liken it to an ice age, but for fire. And so, you know, fire is a reaction. It happens, it goes away. Uh, ice sits there. So there are different properties, but we are changing sea levels. We are causing mass extinctions. Uh, we are rearranging and redefining the character of large biogeographic areas. All of this looks a lot like the Ice Age, except that in this case, it's being driven by uh, our fire habits. And again, I'm speaking with Stephen Pine, and the author and expert on the history, ecology, and management of fire. He is the Emeritus Professor in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University and the author of Between Two Fires, A Fire History of Contemporary America. And he has an article at The Guardian, The Australian Fires Are a Harbinger of Things to Come. Don't ignore their warning. Well, the irony is, of course, in terms of the politics of doing something about the dire scenarios that you just talked about, Stephen, the Australian Prime Minister is climate dire, and he's in the pocket of the coal lobby. And also the Murdoch press, Rupert Murdoch's press, dominates Australia to the point, I think, at two-thirds of the newspapers and television in Australia are controlled by Murdoch. So you have, in essence, Fox News dominating the entire media in Australia and promoting denial. But how can you keep denying the reality? This biggest city in, the, in Australia, Sydney, for example, the air is ten times as thick with smoke that's considered to be safe to breathe. And it's so bad that indoor fire alarms have been set off by it. There's ferries in Sydney Harbour can't operate because they can't see, they can't navigate because of the smog. Even the city of Melbourne is choked by smoke. And there's so much smoke coming from Australia all the way across to New Zealand that it's changed the colours of the glaciers in New Zealand from white to grey. Well, uh, if, you know, people will say what they want to say or what they're paid to say. Um, I think the, the excuse I've heard uh, is that, well, Australia is not a big contributor and that even though a, a large fraction of its, of its energy comes from uh, coal-fired plants, and interestingly enough, it were the power lines from the coal-fired plants that uh, caused most of the fatalities, started the fires that caused most of the fatalities in Black Saturday. But Australia is a major exporter of coal and gas, and largely to China. And Australia was able to ride through uh, the recession without a blip. They've they've had almost 30 years of unbroken economic growth, uh, and you know, su supplying commodities largely for China has been a big part of it. So I can understand the political concern about it, but uh, they can't escape. They are exporting large fractions. So nobody in the U.S., I mean, the U.S. is hardly in a position uh, to cast stones here. Uh, we're not only, we have political party and president who not only deny climate change, but are doing everything they can to aggravate it. So I, <laughs> I'm not sure what to say. I, I think I can imagine uh, the kind of world we're creating. Uh, in a large scale, and it's going to be very, very difficult to unwind. All the stuff that we've got, we've got out there, uh, is going to take a long time uh, to to remove. And in fact, a lot of what will remove it, if we uh, plant for us, if we do other kinds of things to store carbon, we're putting more fuel back into the landscape, into the living landscape. So we're going to have to manage those fires. And they don't all have to be wildfires. They could be controlled fires. They could be a variety of scaling of fires, which is what we're experimenting. People on the ground are experimenting with uh, here in the States. Um, but I think the future is going to look like a lot of fire. And even as we withdraw from burning these lithic landscapes, we're still going to have a lot of fire in living landscapes, and we're probably going to need a lot more fire. So the future looks like uh, a lot of fire for certainly through my grandkids' life. But but when you talk about Australia, in effect, getting, assuming that they've got a break, I mean, this dreadful prime minister yeah. they have, who's, who's also, you know, deeply religious, born-again Christian, mm -hmm. the same evangelical church that Mike Pence belongs to, and whether or not he believes in the rapture or not, like Mike Pence does, I don't know. But his excuse is that Australia is has met the Kyoto goals, even though Kyoto was pretty much extinct. But that's completely 
distorted because the reality is that if Australia doesn't produce as much CO2 as China, but China's producing CO2 because it gets its coal from Australia. And, it, and they're, it, they're being an enabler. Exactly. And, uh, I really like Australia, and I've had wonderful experiences there and have had great context and great fun learning about Australian history and writing about its its bushfires. But um, th this is, you know, this is really um, hypocrisy at, at a new level. And frankly, if the Prime Minister or Mike Pence doesn't want to pay attention to science, they might look to scriptures. I was thinking, I was struck by Proverbs 30, 15 to 16, and it says there are four things that are never satisfied. I think it was, let's see, the, the grave, the barren womb, the land with too little water, and the fire that saith not it is enough. Well, Australia's got three of those four. So maybe that, maybe he should read his, his uh, scripture, if not his science. Well, but the fires themselves, they will produce as much carbon from the burning of these plants that it'll double Australia's national carbon emissions yeah. for a year or more. That's true, but it's also the case that, you know, when you burn uh, the bush, uh, it regrows. I mean, that's the big difference. Burning in these living landscapes um, is, a, is a big exercise in recycling. And some of it, the scale may be longer than we want or can tolerate, but it is a recycling project. Whereas taking stuff out of fossil biomass and burning that, that is taking stuff out of the geologic past and releasing it into the geologic future. That is a different thing. And people can be very slippery in their reasoning and say, well, Australia has always had fires, but has not had fires quite like they've seen over the last 20 years. Uh, and, you know, we're releasing all this carbon by burning the bush. See, that's, that's the bush is the problem. No, that that is reabsorbed. Nature takes care of that. That operates within certain ecological boundaries. But when you burn fossil biomass, all the ecological constraints are gone. You can burn day and night, winter and summer, drought or deluge. It doesn't matter. You can keep pumping it out. So all the little checks and balances that operate to keep fire in the bush uh, from destroying the bush are removed. So they're really two different there are really two different kinds of fire, two realms of fire here, and they operate in different ways, and it's really dishonest to conflate them in the way that some of the apologists are doing. Sure, but if, in the case of Australia, you can't contain the fires because of global warming, because it simply gets hotter and hotter, and therefore making it more and more likely that a spark will ignite uh, because everything is so dry and they have volunteer firefighters there, and the yeah. Prime Minister just reluctantly decided to pay them yeah. after several have been killed in these fires. So, but the area that we can deal with is, is the stored carbon, surely. That, sure. that is the issue of global warming. That's the political issue that, yeah. that they didn't deal with adequately in Madrid recently, and they still haven't been able to deal with. Do you think we'll reach a point where we'll simply ban the extraction of coal, oil, and gas from the earth. Well, that would be uh, that would be useful. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't mind the use of coal or oil for other products, uh, some of which are useful and an alternative to using wood or whatever. Um, I I think it would be very hard to ban it, but you can ban the use of it in certain ways. You can certainly uh, mandate, say, electric cars. Well, the, where's the electricity coming from? Are you are you getting that from burning fossil fuels? But we can we can work around that. Uh, I think a ban might be nice, but is unrealistic. I think you can just make it impractical and uneconomical, and maybe shameful, and that would be the best you can do. It's going to take a generation change. I I just don't see the current structure. Responding, but, but given what's happening in Australia, when you have a, the leadership of the country, just like our leadership here, our global warming deniers, and in the pocket of the fossil fuel industries, you know the fact that so far an area larger than Vermont and New Hampshire combined has burned, and more will burn, and at least it's up to a billion animals, kangaroos and koalas, and others have 
about me being killed. And that is a kind of, you know, the, they're the icons of that country. And on top of that, of course, you have the great tourist icon, the Barrier Reef. It is dying because of global warming. And most of the the kind of right wing they call it in Australia they call the North Queensland the Deep North because it has a sort of conservative reactionary politics of the Deep South here in this country so th it's pretty hard to understand how the Queenslanders uh, would have their, their political representatives would be global warming deniers when their greatest asset the barrier reef is dying so I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the evidence is so overwhelming now, I don't think these politicians can get away with denial much longer, do you? I don't think so in Australia, but we'll, we'll have to see. And part of my interest in creating a, a concept like the pyrocene and shifting the discussion to fire is that it goes at some of these issues a little sideways. Right now there are so many entrenched positions and everybody just digs in and parrots the same thing. I'm trying to find another language and another set of concepts to go at it because many uh, so many people who uh, want to deflect uh, the criticism away from uh, fossil fuels and climate change will say well there are all these other things are contributing land use past fire history all this sort of, and I agree that may at this point it's an equal factor but when you trace it back those are being underwritten by the same fossil fuel transition so my, my effort is to get at the core which is the fossil fuel stuff uh, and and find arguments through fire why binge burning is not a good idea I don't know what to say uh, about Australia uh, it's just going on and on it's a national I mean from West Australia uh, all the way across uh, to New South Wales um, they're being slammed and I if that can't change things um, I mean I don't know I don't know how to change it I mean, right. We, we can appeal to science, we can appeal to history, mm -hmm. we can appeal to common sense. I'm even willing to appeal to scripture, as I quoted before. Right. But I don't know, you know, at some point. <laughs> well, it, you mentioned from Western Australia to the East Coast, to Sydney, but you've got to even go down to South. Uh, Victoria has been on fire, tourists have been sure. trapped, and then even further south, Kangaroo Island, the entire island is on fire. So it's all around and that. Tasmania. And, and Tasmania. And Tasmania, too. At, right. Is that fires as well. So from the deep north to the far south, uh, I mean, it's just, it, it just, it's always been patchy. Certain places get it at certain times, some years rather than others. But to have it universal like this is really an extraordinary event. It, I, I'm not sure I could accept that this is going to happen year after year. There were too many, too many, rhythms and things going on but I think we're seeing the cumulative effects and we really have entered a new era and fire is going fire is very sensitive to the world around it it integrates the conditions that are out there and so we're seeing conditions that are going to encourage fire and then fire itself will create the circumstances for more fire but just in closing the fact that the temperatures are rising will continue to rise because of global warming and the temperatures are clearly what are driving this particular fire season if temperatures continue to rise because of global warming then won't australia be in a state of perpetual fire well the vegetation won't return to what it has been it will come back to something different but it may come back to something that's more amenable to routine burning rather than having large ash forests um, in the mountains, you may go to more uh, scrub. You may go down to grasses, in which case you will have plenty of fire. They won't be the same kind of fire. So if conditions change, you won't get the same things back. But it seems very likely that whatever comes back, you're going to have a lot of fire. And, you, and will the animals come back, though? Well, they'll have to adapt. Uh, Australia's... Uh, Animals have adapted through a lot of extraordinary climatic events over geologic history. Whether they can adapt to something that's happening so suddenly, I don't know. I, I, I can't speak to that. Well, Stephen Pine, you've given us an awful lot to think about, and I appreciate you joining us here today. Well, thank you.
And again, I've been speaking with Stephen Pine, an author and expert on the history, ecology, and management of fire. He is the Emeritus Professor in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University and the author of Between Two Fires, A Fire History of Contemporary America. And he has an article at The Guardian, The Australian Fires Are a Harbinger of Things to Come. Don't ignore their warning. We can take a brief station break.